Hi, I'm Scott Rank, host of the History Unplugged podcast. If you have listened to this podcast before, you know that it typically doesn't begin with power metal. Well, this episode is different because we're going to be talking about what power metal can tell us about World War I. Specifically, I'm talking to Joachim Broden, lead singer of Sabaton, who is releasing a concept album all about World War I, about soldiers who fought in the war, about notable figures like Lawrence of Arabia and the Red Baron, about what it was like to be at the Battle of the Somme and be a British soldier who sees a tank coming over the horizon for the first time in military history, what it's like to deal with poisonous gas and to be involved in one of the most violent and ghastly wars in human history. In this episode, I'll be talking with Joachim about these different historical characters he focuses on, such as Alvin York, one of the most decorated American soldiers of the war, who killed at least 25 enemy soldiers and captured 132, and lesser-known figures like Francis Pegamagabau, a First Nationer from Canada who was the most effective sniper of World War I, credited with killing 378 Germans and capturing 300 more. So I think this is a completely different take on history that this podcast mostly deals with, but I had a lot of fun, and I love analyzing history in unconventional ways, like Swedish power metal. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Joachim, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I have to say, I love the concept of your album, where you're combining power metal and World War I, which typically don't go together. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> But that's why I love it, because it's introducing things to different audiences on both sides, on history lovers and um, metal lovers. So what gave you the idea to create a concept album on World War I? I mean, I think it goes back to 2008 or something. We had an album then called The Art of War, which is, well, we have a song corresponding for every chapter of the military text, The Art of War. And, uh, for a few of them, we chose topics from World War One, And even though, obviously, we knew some of it, doing that research kind of ignited the spark, I would say. Uh, so we thought, hey, man, we can't just do a song or two about this topic. we got to do an album about this. However, it took us, well, 11 years to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you definitely didn't slack off in your research. And in the first song that opens the album, The Future of Warfare, it's set in the Battle of the Somme in 1916 when the British 32nd Division is fighting. And they see something appear over the horizon and it's tanks. And from what I've read of accounts of this time, they're so shocking to the senses of soldiers, they might as well be seeing dragons. And what are you trying to convey with this song? Well, not in particular with that song, but also with the whole album in a way, because I think for me, it feels like I'm no expert by any means, but I'm very passionate about history. And that is that it seems like World War I is where we see the last days of traditional old school warfare, I guess, and the birth of modern warfare at the same time, depending on, you know, which battlefield or which time during the war you're looking at it. Obviously, the tanks were later perfected by Guderian and Rommel and the boys in World War Two, into something most people will relate to, like Blitzkrieg. But uh, it was such a appealing image and a thing to talk about, you know, that whole thing. Because as you said, nobody had seen tanks. Today, looking at those old Mother Mark ones, I guess, that were rolling up wouldn't be that scary. But for soldiers back then, I mean, it's uh, really easy and dangerous, I think, to judge soldiers and their actions in combat a long time ago from a modern lens and with what we know today. Another song of yours, you're also looking at these unforeseen types of weapons, uh, Attack of the Dead Men, where you turn to the Eastern Front, where the Germans are fighting the Russians and using poisonous gas when the Russians are trying to defend the fortress of Ossowites. So what's the focus of this song and what you're trying to convey? Well, in that sense, it was such a fantastic story, basically. It feels like that was the walking dead you know a hundred years before the tv series <laughs> <laughs> in a way not a big fan of the the whole zombie movie thing i think it's been over, done and overdone me by many times but actually i came across that story quite some time ago and it's been heavily recommended by our fans as well over the years because we have a page on our site where people can recommend us basically ideas for songs and stuff such things and it's hugely useful because every country really has its own history because you know what every school child knows in maybe sweden might be totally unheard of in argentina or somewhere else in the world so uh, 
for us, being interested in military history, being able to get in touch with these topics and having people mailing us links or even sometimes giving us books, it's a huge privilege, I guess, to be able to hear about these things. Sometimes we even meet active soldiers or veterans who fought in the battles we sang about. So. Yeah, in terms of like conveying what World War One is, in terms of music stylings, I think metal really has something because... If there's a war that conveys what hell looks like, I think World War I is that where there are accounts of people whose faces are blown off and they die shortly afterwards. I have a question for you about artistic interpretation, because in the final track of your album, there's a choral rendition of In Flanders Field, and this is based on a poem from John McRae, and the singing is done in the choral musical stylings of early 20th century music. And that's what people listen to in the early 20th century, that or opera. If a person from World War I listened to your album, I think they'd be really surprised because the style is so different. So in terms of, um, I guess, artistic interpretation, how do you think that your music style, which is very different from what existed at World War I, convey the themes of World War I? Oh, I have no idea. That's a really good question, <laughs> my friend. Uh, <laughs> I haven't really even considered it from that point of view, what people would think of it, you know, from their point of view. Well, from a more general point of view, I, th I feel like our music or our style of heavy metal or whatever you want to call it is pretty um, emotionally close to, from the emotional spectrum, I guess, that's in our music. It's pretty emotionally close to what you'd find on the battlefield or in history. There is obviously the aggression, sometimes a sense of, joy and pride, sometimes depression, and all of these things. And uh, all of these elements can be found in our music well, while also in military history. So from that point of view, I think it makes so much sense. And also, I'm thinking, you know, or actually not me, we are all in the band thinking that there are so many fantastic stories in our past that are being forgotten. So why the hell are we making up new ones? Absolutely. It's kind of like military music. You could look at things like the drummers in the Ottoman Empire, the Janissaries. And speaking of the Ottoman Empire, which is sort of my specialty, you move to the Eastern Front in the war when you focus on Lawrence of Arabia. And the song title is Seven Pillars of Wisdom, which was his autobiography. That's the darkness falls and Arabia falls on this place he's So how did you choose Lawrence of Arabia and what was your interest in him to focus on in your album? Well, I'm 38 now, so I remember, you know, the older generation talking about Lawrence of Arabia. And I heard that name and, you know, for me, being a kid, that was a movie. <laughs> <laughs> and still, you know, we almost missed it because, you know, Lawrence of Arabia, the myth of him and also the Red Baron, it's so big that you don't instantly, at least for me, I intellectually knew that both of them are legends from World War I. However, they're so big in themselves that we were starting to research World War I. The first things that came to our minds weren't Lawrence of Arabia or the Red Baron, which should have been the obvious ones, but we were rather looking at, oh yeah, Harlem Hellfighters, we should do a song about these guys, and the Bruce Love Offensive, and this and that. And um, we always start with like, I don't know, somewhere between... 80 to 100 topics, which are very quickly scaled down to a more manageable 60 to 40. And then the real work starts with the research. And sometimes actually our pet projects or the you know, topics we are most passionate about don't make it to the album because we don't have the music to do that story justice. So instead of just slapping a story onto a piece of music because we feel like it, we've noticed that it's better we... We save those ideas for another time, I guess. But with Lawrence, I think it's such a captivating story. And I, you know, I really like the movie. I love the story. I don't like his book, though. That was pain <laughs> to go through. I wouldn't actually recommend anyone to read his book, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Read about Lawrence. Yes, see the movie. Fine. Don't read that book. 
<laughs> <laughs> it was agony. But uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I think also the stories of his, his exploits could be a really good way of, you know, getting somebody interested in history or World War One because somehow uh, schools have a, you know, I wouldn't say the schools, but rather the school system has a superpower, and that is turning amazing stories into boring history. Yes, <laughs> and, it really uh, does, yes. Instead of, you know, okay, so a Serbian guy kills an Austrian, so the English have to go to France to fight the Germans. It's like, what? You know, already there, I'm lost, you know, I'm lost interest at least. And if you talk about World War One as a conflict, how alliances are triggered and how everything is going on. I mean, if you start there, which is going to be in the school systems books in most countries I've come across anyway, it's dead boring. And you lost the kids interest even before you actually got to the start of it. How about instead, let's say it's an inspiring story and pretty, I think, intriguing story. Start to talk about Lawrence, you know, and what he did. And make it stories, not history. Make it stories. All of a sudden, people are going to be, oh, what? Especially kids. Yeah, because he was helping the Arab revolt against the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire, what's that? I haven't seen that on a map. Ah, here we go. Now we got kids hooked and, you know, things are rolling. For your next album, if you focus on something like Auditurk or the Gallipoli campaign, I'd be happy to be an informal advisor for that because I think there's a lot to work through there. That's always good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I want to follow up on some of the other people you do focus on in stories. But before I do that, something you mentioned earlier where you said that you had stories, but you didn't have the music. So you scratched that off your list. What do you mean by that? You had the stories, but you didn't have the music. Well, every album we go into when we talk about the topic, sometimes we have a few songs written, but the majority is written after we know what we're dealing with. No matter how hard we try, sometimes we can't do the music that we try to write doesn't do the story justice. And then it's better that we believe it and make it another day in the future. Every time we make an album, it feels like for every story we choose to sing about, we're abandoning 10 others somehow. Sometimes the stories are similar. We don't want the same kind of stories on an album. For example, we covered the introduction of tanks, which already, you know, introducing a new piece of technology, which automatically disqualified a song about the introduction of submarines, in our minds at least, to get a big, good mix on the album. Sometimes, yeah, we try and we try, but we don't have a song that fits or a song that's good enough that we feel for a certain topic. Then we leave it until maybe a couple of years later where we can make it happen. In terms of the people you focus on, there's a lot. Uh, there's Alvin York, who distinguished himself many times in the First World War. And I always forget to pronounce the French words, Musée Argonne Offensive. Yeah. The Red Baron. But then you also focus on some lesser known figures. And one of the people I thought was most interesting that you looked at was Francis. Uh, how do you pronounce it? I think it's Pegamagabo. Okay. Yeah, I always have to go to Forvo.com, which helps me uh, translate languages in different languages. That's how his uh, grandson said it anyway. So I figured that's close enough for me. They're an authoritative source, right? <laughs> yeah. Just for context, for listeners that don't know about him, he was at the Battle of uh, Below Woods. He's a, in the Canadian military and one of the most effective snipers in World War One, and also part of the indigenous Inuit population of Canada. So... Could you tell me about how you chose his story and why you wanted to focus on him? Oh, well, that was actually an orphan song because uh, me and the guitar player wrote a song late 2017 together because we wanted to find out, hey, can we write songs together? And we could. And we had this song, which is was kind of upbeat and catchy, but a little bit sad at the same time. No matter how many stories... 